This morning our call to worship comes from Psalms 19, verse 1 through 14, which reads, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hand. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. Like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heaven and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect. Amen. Amen. Refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, much more pure, much more than pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there, in keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of transgressions. May these words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Dear Lord, Father, God, we thank you so much for this day, Father. As, as it says, your works declare your glory, Father. When the sun rises every day to the flowers growing, it all gives testament to how great you are, Father. But the greatest is your love for us and how you forgive us for our transgressions and how you died for our sins, Jesus. And so, Father, we turn the service over to your hand. May it all be for your glory, Father. Bless the praising and the, the praise and the worship. Bless, bless the speakers. And, Father, we put it all in your hands in the name of our Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So we can all stand, so we can praise the Lord together. Thank you. 
blessings and giving of our tithes and offerings. We give from a heart of love. When we give, God promises a blessing in return. Every blessing from our loving God. God desires to pour out his love and grace upon us. And now let us give faithfully with our hearts. And we can give. We have uh, two ways to give. So that's what we are called to do. Now, Proverbs 1 through 20, 33, it said, Speak about the wisdom of God. Cry out in the street, but no one listen. Isn't that happening today? None of us want to listen to the good news. All we are about bad news. So God is telling us, said, hey, we need to make a change. Where do it start within the individual that you and me in order for it to be in order for it to happen? And Mark 8, 27 through 38. What did Jesus say? Jesus expand, explained the wisdom sacrifice all to do what? To follow him. Not follow me, but follow him to Christ. And it definitely going to bring good news and happiness, love, peace, and joy. We are not experiencing that today. 
But that's what Christ has called us to do. Call out to the world and let them know that, is, that we need to make a change. See, in order to have peace and joy and happiness. And James 3, 1 through 12, um, speak about wisdom. Seek. What? Seek what? Seek whom? Who are we supposed to seek? Our Lord and Savior. Seek Him to what? Control. Should I say that in my tongue? Because sometimes I don't know how to zip it. But I'm trying to with all y'all help to zip it. And what the really likes about um, Psalm 14, it said, let the word of my mouth, my heart itself, Lord, my rock, and my redeemer. That's all what we can get to do when we put our, our mind and heart in Christ, that we will have peace. But I always like to say, I want to take too much of time uh, to express the message today. But I like to say, focus in on what? Faith, hope, love, peace, joy, and happiness. What a world we would live in if we had all peace, had love and compassion for one another. And uh, the main message will be brought to us, if I may say, our pastor, Louis Aponte, and my lovely wife, who has God blessing on this message today. Please join me in prayer to our Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father, the true and living God, God and the Father, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, how wonderful and lovely are you. You are so great. And Father, as we come before your throne, this, this afternoon, Father, I can imagine we're all sitting around your throne, listening to your word. And we thank you so very much for the word that you have prepared for us. I thank you for the building, the place that we have to worship. And we thank you so very much, Father, for bringing us here safely through this week. And we thank you so very much for the cross. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for restoring us to our Heavenly Father. And Father, we are here to hear from you. You are God who speaks through us, to us, through your word, through the Holy Spirit, through your servant. And we are blessed to have your word. And you say the fear of you is beginning of wisdom. Wisdom comes from you. And that wisdom that comes from you is peace loving. And we want more of that today, Lord God. We, more, we want more discernment. We want more understanding of you so that we can honor you in all our actions, in all our thoughts, and our way we conduct ourselves. So God, please open the eyes that we may see, ears to hear, and the heart that will understand and be here different than when we came. Being refreshed, being refreshed, oh God, and being wiser as your word said that your, your love make us, make the simple wiser. And it refreshes us, it sustains us, and it cleanses us and purifies our soul. And that Jesus prayed, sanctify us with thy truth. Thy word is truth, O oh God. And you are, Jesus Christ, is our wisdom. Is our wisdom. We want to grow. We want to mature in you. And I just ask your blessing upon each and every one in this congregation this afternoon, Father, that you will meet our spiritual needs 
our physical need and our emotional need. And I give you all the glory and that's your blessing upon this sermon. Bless his speaker, inspire him, and encourage him. In Jesus Christ's holy and righteous name, I pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Well, greetings, everyone. Greetings and a warm welcome also to the GCI home church as well. The horrific attack, you may be thinking, what am I referring to? The horrific, horrific attack in 9-11-2001 changed us for the better, but it also changed us for the worse. At 9-11, people came together. They came together to help each other through the process. They came together, they actually increased the attendance in churches. The families got closer together. And in fact, New York City was healed because people were united just after the attack. It brought the worst in individuals, but it also brought the best in individuals. On the other hand, for our nation, it, it tarnished our invisibility at that moment. It also made us vulnerable. We thought this could never happen, ever happen to us in our homeland in the United States. So it's natural that it brings strong emotions. Every year when we celebrate as people, the emotions will come back up because the memory is brought up on that particular date. It kindles anger, it summons our fears, and sinks many of us into sadness. Like any other memory in which you want to avoid, but on that anniversary, it comes back, doesn't it? For Christians, for all of us, a tragedy like 9-11 will test us. It will challenge us to live our belief in the middle of difficult circumstances. It will bring us anger, Obviously, we should be angry about these things to happen. However, we have to be careful that in our anger, we don't call people animals. That we don't dehumanize individuals as well. Because whether we like it or not, everyone was made in the image of God. Well, understandable, well, understandable that our anger should be there. Jesus says that we should love our enemies. Difficult, difficult thing to kind of absorb as human beings, isn't it? Very difficult thing to do, but he says it in Matthew chapter 5, 44. Yes, we should condemn this monstrous act and any other monstrous act, but we should be careful not to dehumanize individuals who have been made in God's image. Amen. So in our text today, Tim tells us that what we believe, what we do, and what we say does matter to God. So I want to I want to ask you if you can please open the word for me. Whether you brought your physical Bibles, whether you brought your electronic Bibles, please open your Bibles and read with me. James chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. And like everything with God's word, as was mentioned in the prayer and the summary, when you read it and let the Spirit lead you, it will start convicting you. Amen? Yes. It will start convicting you. And you may say to yourself, I read this before. I understand it. No, but now I'll read it with asking God to convict you with the word. So let's take a look at it. Now many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body 
in check. Then he uses an analogy. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey, we can turn the whole animal or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Verse 5, listen carefully. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. <laughs> and now he gets really down to the center of it all. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire. It's also a fire. Have mercy. Have mercy. A world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body. Sets the whole course of one's life on fire. And is itself set on fire by hell itself. Stay close, right? It's a little too, too, too close, some would say here. Yeah. Right? But James is not finished. Verse 7. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. Jesus. Verse 9, brothers and sisters, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing, my brothers and sisters. This should not be. Notice the analogy in verse 11. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Amen. This is a deep book, and it is a challenging book, isn't it? Make, James is making us right now very uncomfortable if we're, we're very honest with ourselves. It tells us not only to say that we are Christians, but to look and behave as Christians in every aspect of our lives. In fact, James is seldom the first choice of sermons because of what it says and how deep it penetrates our souls. It forces us to take a hard look at ourselves. It forces us to ask, are we living like we are believers in Christ Jesus our Lord? It puts the mirror in front of us and says, what do you think as we look at it? This kind of introspection is often uncomfortable as it may be for all of you, as it is for me right now as I read this. In fact, uh, Martin Luther called it the epistle of straw because he thought that this was kind of selling or preaching works, right? Uh, the works will get you the salvation that you need. This was more like works, you know, type of message. But some scholars are saying that maybe this message by James also hit Luther close because he was known to use unfiltered words and colorful language. So, like many of us, perhaps James' admonition got too close to him as well. Right? Interesting. So what about us? What about us? Is, are these verses heading home close to us right now? The chances are you're squirming a little bit in, in, in your seats. Because if you think back and you play the movies of your life, how many times has this tongue got you into trouble? At times, I'm going to have to confess now if you don't mind. May I make a confession? Can I make a confession? I struggle with my words. I do. I struggle with my words. 
I get angry and I say things I shouldn't say in my anger. When someone disagrees vehemently with me, I speak harshly of that individual. And sometimes I just, off the top of my head, say things. And then when I walk away, I say to myself, no, that wasn't really true. What you just said, you were exaggerating it. Sometimes I speak empty words just for the sake of speaking because I have to have the last word without much thought on the intentions and the fact that I should have been taming my words at that moment. So in today's message, we're going to dig deeper. Now you say, stop. Stop. Don't speak anymore about this because I can't take it any longer. Well, too, can I say too bad? I'm going to go forward a little longer. It was another word came out of my mouth, right? But anyway, we're going to go longer and we're going to see how we can participate in taming the tongue. Now, the key word there is participate. Well, I'll explain that later. What, is that, what does that mean to participate in taming my tongue? And we'll learn some lessons as a result of it. James describes the tongue as powerful, but then he says it is evil, and then he says it's untamable. Why, you ask? Because when I speak those words that do more damage than good, I'm speaking from the darkness of my heart. I am speaking from the darkness of my heart. So he compares it to a fire. Right? In verse 6, he says, It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire. When I read that and I looked at the history of my words, how many relationships I damaged behind me because of my words and the darkness that was expressed from my words. I left burnt things behind me. We think about it. It corrupts the whole course of one's life on fire. On Proverbs 18.21, it goes forth. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life. And again here it says, set on fire by hell. And you wonder if James was referring to this scripture as he was writing his letter. Hmm. See, we have to understand since the fall, when Adam and Eve fell, that we have had an orientation to always try to get away from God. Mm -hmm. Away from Him. But then when we go away from something, we have to realize we're always embracing something else. And we call them the idols. Well, we don't call them, but that's what they are. Yeah. <laughs> now, no one's going to admit, oh, I'm going to go ahead and hug my idol today. Right? right? Or to put, put a lot of time into my idol today. Mm -hmm. Not many people say that. But it's all things that take God's place in our lives. So sin is not something we just do. It is something that comes from our corrupted nature. And here's the thing. It penetrates deep in our soul. In other words, it goes into our very cells of our bodies. That's how corrupt it can be on human beings. This is why we cannot tame our tongue on our own. There's no way. You can go home and try to tame your tongue. I guarantee you. Tomorrow morning you say, I can't do it. Darn it, I can't do it. All right? So James pulls no punches when he says, It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. So the truth is, we cannot change our own nature by our own strength. Amen? Amen. And so that's why James says, pay attention to what comes out of your, out of your mouth. Mm -hmm. The words that come out of your mouth. Are your words life-giving? Are they? Or mostly empty and meaningless? Or worse yet, are they coarse and destructive? I know a lot of angry people. Those words are coarse and destructive. 
Whatever the case, our tongues indicate the condition of our hearts. And that's the bottom line. How's your heart? Yeah. Because it's being reflected by your tongue. Amen. Here's the good news. We have the Holy Spirit. Yes. Yeah. The same Spirit who worked in Jesus is in us, and we must call on that Spirit yes. to help us. Yes. Yes. That's our guarantee that we will be redeemed. It empowers us to do what Jesus does and gives us what's in Jesus in us. We just have to draw on that power. See, by the Spirit, we can better control our tongues mm -hmm. and receive conviction when we say harmful things. The key is to recognize it before it comes out of your mouths. So our only hope is in Jesus. If you're sitting right there and saying, I can't control my tongue whatsoever. Well, your hope is in Jesus. He was perfect in word and in action. Amen? Amen. And when you receive him as Lord and Savior, he's in you. The one who's perfect in word and action is in you. Helping you, if you want, to control your tongues. So we can learn from his example. So our only hope is Jesus. I'll repeat it again. He's the only one who can control what we say because he's the only one who can cleanse us from the inside out yeah. he's the one who can take the darkest places by the way we still remain mm -hmm. in some cases that you need to take out yeah. and he will cleanse you from yes. it yes. he will redeem your tongue yes. basically what I'm saying here so in order to learn how to best participate in taming our tongues I'm going to use a special tree so here's the story behind that special tree in October 2001, a month after the Twin Towers were just dust, they were reduced to rubble. On ground zero, there was a calorie pear tree. For those of you who know about trees, you may know what that means, what is. That was somehow there in the middle of all this, clinging to life. Its branches were broken and burned. It had snapped roots and looked like all the other dead trees around the rubble. Except that it was still alive. It was still clinging to life. So for the workers who had seen death and destruction, this was a sign for them. The previously ornate calorie pear tree became a symbol of something deeper for them. They had to cling on to something good, and that was that, was that tree. So the workers were determined to make something out of that tree from ground zero, so made, they made the tremendous effort to rescue it, and now it's known as a survivor tree. Mm -hmm. They did not know if they were going to be successful, but they were going to do it. They felt they had to try it. So they gently dug up this tree and took it to a nursery where its burns were treated, its broken limbs were pruned, and its roots were planted rich in soil. Can you see the symbolism in all that? In our own lives? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. In fact, if you go to Ground Zero, you will see that nine years later, it was returned to Ground Zero, and now people use it to find shade of this beautiful, mighty tree. Wow. Notice the difference. Close to death, yes. flourishing in life. Amen. Hallelujah. So here's three lessons I want to get from this analogy of the survivor tree. First of all, you notice that it was removed from the dead and destroyed things in its life. Then you notice that it was immersed in life-giving things. And then you notice that it was returned to bring life to where, the, to where there was no life before. So here's the first lesson for all of us. Number one, remove the dead and destroyed things in your life. If you want to be your own survivor tree, survivor tree in, the, in the name of Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit, you have to be willing to surrender everything that is dead and destroyed in your life. No excuses. That's how we begin to tame our tongues. That's the first step, to get rid of these things. And this begins, by the way, with prayer. It really begins with a lot of earnest prayer before our Father in heaven. He is the only one who's going to show us what's deep, deep inside of us that will hinder our relationship with Him and is hindering our relationship with others. 
And I want to encourage you when you pray, use a Bible verse such as Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. It says here, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now, for those of you who have not prayed from scriptures such as this, let me give you an example of how I would pray this. Father in heaven, I come before your presence in full assurance of faith in Christ Jesus. I ask that you show me those things that do not speak life to others. Clean my heart from an evil conscience and wash me with the pure water of your Holy Spirit. And you grab more scriptures like that, bring them before the mighty Father in heaven, Christ Jesus. And once God shows us what we need to do to promote life in our life, we have to take the bold step to break away from that. Temporarily in some cases, permanently in others. Only you know what that is. So, I would make it simple. It could be just shows that you're watching. They're just corrupting your nature. It could be music that you're hearing too. They're just not. God glorify music. It could be that you need to take a harder look at other things, especially people who don't bring life to you. Don't bring life to you. They have a negative impact. And even nowadays, it's just the news. I mean, you watch the news for half an hour, you're like angry at somebody, right? Right? I was at peace. But then I made a mistake. I'm going to see what's on the news today. And I'm like, oh, it's from up. And then I may say something to my wife, and she'll say, hey. Right? Right? Watch what you're saying there. All right? So that's what we need to do. It's important to follow the lead of the Holy Spirit to move away from the things that are dead in our lives. And only God can reveal that specifically to your journey with Him. To your journey with him. Those things that influence our tongues. Specifically here, we're talking about the tongue itself. So in the process, that's what we need to do first, is to remove those things. But then we go into step number two, using the survival to be an example. We need to immerse ourselves in what gives life. Amen. Right? So we give away what does not give me life spiritually. And I'm going to move forward toward those things that do give me life spiritually but here's the principle of life you cannot get rid of something if you keep thinking about that something make sense so for example whatever you do do not think of an elephant right now do not think of the floppy ears please don't do that don't look at his long bendy snout don't look at his wrinkled skin and that particular smell that it has on the zoo. <laughs> Please don't think of an elephant. Guess what you're doing? You think of an elephant. You see, unless you have superhuman concentration, whatever I put in your mind, you're thinking about it. So it's likely to stop negative things if you're still thinking about that negative thing. Remember, you have to get rid of the dead. That's the negative. And you have to replace it with things that give you life. So stop doing those things and surround yourselves with the better things. That's what God says. Mm -hmm. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. I love this one. This is the filter of everything that's entering our minds. Are you all ready? Okay. Finally, brothers, what is true? What is honorable? What is just? What is pure? What is lovely? What is commendable? If there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Amen. Now, granted, I understand, easier said than done, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, you can do it. You can do it. So, listen to more sermons. There's plenty of them going around all week long. You want to really learn more about God's Word, be inspired by it. 
Open the Bible more often. Read it. Amen. Amen. Read the devotionals. There's so much of devotionals out there. Get into it deeply. The worship music. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. First thing in the morning, put that put those that music on. Put that music on. Especially if you have some bad dreams the night before. Put that music on. You see, these are all things that allow us to immerse ourselves into life-giving sources that God provides for us every day. Okay. Does that mean that you're going to get the escape from it? You may get that phone call of the angry individual who says you haven't done this and done that and you, have, you are a bad person because of whatever. Okay? <laughs> Worship. Right? Not to say you have to do anything about that. I'm just saying you got to clean that out now. Right? Because anger will kick in if you don't do so. Remove the dead and destroyed things in your life. Immerse yourself in the life-giving things, and then I'm going to give you the third. Bring to life that which was near death. What's that mean? The tree was taken back to its where it came from, ground zero. And there, that tree gave life to others who approached it. It became a shade for those who were suffering from the heat of the sun. You see where I'm going here? It became inspiration for everyone. Similarly, that's what God is asking us to do. I took you from dead works, bring you into work of life, the works of life, and I'm going to send you back to that dark area, and I'm going to ask you to bring light to it. Right? In other words, he's saying to us, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Here I am back again. Dead as dead could have been as a human being spiritually and I'm back here again to bring life to those around me. If you're the only light they see, let it be the only light they see, but you're the light. So what does that mean? All this means that we're filling ourselves up with things so that our tongues are speaking life. Mm -hmm. Our tongues are speaking life to the glory of the Father in heaven in Christ Jesus our Lord by the leading of the Holy, of the Holy Spirit. So we're called to leave behind the dead in us, the destroyed things in us. We're called to immerse ourselves in the life of Jesus in all the things He gives us, powerfully growing in Him and then we're called not to be secluded from society, but to go back and bring life to those God is calling you to bring life to. Amen? Amen. To bring back to life the spiritually dead, because Jesus will use many of you to make that happen. He will make that happen. Bring back the spiritually dead. So it's important that we not only say that we are Christians. We have to act and live and breathe and speak like the Christians that we are. Immersing ourselves in Christ Jesus our Lord. The one who gives spiritual life, the spiritual waters, right? The Holy Spirit to us. He is your best approach to all things. Participate in his ministry to bring life to the spiritually dead as he brought you back from spiritual death. So, can we tame our tongues on our own? No, no, no. We can't. There's no way you can. So that's a good news. Take a deep breath. Okay. <laughs> that's so bad. All right? And we cannot tame our, our, our tongues on our own strength. In other words, it's like reading, you know, pray over and over with the same thing, kind of our own strength, trying to bring this change in our ways. That will not happen. Our only hope is in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And I can't say this enough, and I'll say, keep saying it. Yes. Because yes. that's where it is. Yes. He is the only one who can give, give you words of life. In Him, we can overcome our tongues. In Him, we can be redeemed. In Him, we can become who the Lord made us to be, brothers and sisters in Christ. In Christ, we can control everything that comes out of our tongues. Amen. So, like the survivor tree, 
I'm going to ask you. Some of you may be like the survivor tree right there, just barely hanging on. Right? I'm asking you to ask God to move you forward. Some of you may be struggling with that, what we call the transition stage, right? I'm pulled in this direction, but God is calling me in this direction. I'm asking you to hang on to Jesus and move mm -hmm. forward. And those of you who are solid on solid ground, you know that soil that God says, the, what we call the quadrant four of the seed parable, on solid ground, ready to give life to others, I'm encouraging you to go ahead and give it to them because this world needs it. They need you. They need me. Life givers. To bring life to them. And you can be the motto to bring life out of death in this society. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much. Thank you so much for your love, mercy, kindness. We do ask the Holy God, who are we? That you take such interest in us. Father, when we look at the mirror, the mirror of your word, sometimes we don't like what we see. We can't, we can't go on at times because it's just so hard to move forward with what we struggle with in our lives. But then you give us hope and you say, Jesus is with you, in you. Receive him. Walk in him. Let him be your partner. In overcoming every aspect of your life, and specifically here in this message, you're taught that whatever comes out is pure, unfiltered, beautiful water, giving water to the thirsty out there. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, O oh Lord God. For this time, in Jesus' most holy, righteous name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
from Colossians 3, verse 16 and 17. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And all can we pray this in Jesus' name, Father. We thank you so much for the message, Father. We thank you that you took us from broken vessels and put us in rich soil to bring us back, Father. Father, those of us that are still there, continue to give us what it is that we need. Oh, Father, we need you every day. But as we grow stronger, Father, help us take the light of you and let it shine in the world, not for our glory, but for your glory, so that people see you and they hear your message of love, Father. And we thank you for this, and we thank you for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Everyone have a wonderful week, and we'll see you next week.